Uh, welcome, welcome everyone to our February 2023 quality program webinar. Uh, this is part of a recurring webinar series that we've been hosting uh, to really update and inform physicians on the menu of quality program options that are available at the CPSO to physicians to participate in and meet their CPSO oh. quality requirements. My name is Ted Everson. I'm a medical advisor at the college and I'll be hosting the webinar today. Uh, some of my other CPSO colleagues will be supporting as well and helping to track questions in the chat and uh, supporting the Q&A at the end of the slide presentation. We are fortunate to have another fantastic guest presentation today. And today we are joined by our colleagues from the Center for Effective Practice and the Evidence to Practice Ontario program. And I'll introduce our co-presenters uh, or do their introductions now. Um, so from, from um, the Evidence to Practice Ontario program, uh, co-presenting today, we have Pippi Scott Muser, who is a manager of digital health at the Center for Effective Practice and program manager on the Evidence to Practice Ontario program, overseeing and supporting the primary care implementations. We have Vithu Kugathasan, who is a manager of digital health projects at North York General Hospital and senior program manager on the Evidence to Practice Ontario program, overseeing acute care implementations. And as well, we have Angelica Golnow, who is the executive lead strategy and partnerships at the Center for Effective Practice and supports the executive of the Evidence to Practice Ontario program. Uh, they will be speaking on their program and resources uh, that can intersect and support physicians in doing quality improvement, and particularly how it can really be an on-ramp for organizations uh, to join the partnership program. Uh, and we're really looking forward to some practical, actionable takeaways uh, from the resources and content that they offer. Uh, in terms of the format today, uh, we will have approximately 30 to 40 minutes of a slide presentation. I'll provide some background on the quality programs at the CPSO and more specifically on the partnership program. And then I'll hand off to our colleagues from the Center for Effective Practice. We will try to push our questions uh, until the end. And uh, uh, so save them as we go along. Certainly you can also insert into the chat and we will try to track those. Uh, to note, this webinar will be recorded and saved to our website as well as our CPSO YouTube channel, where you can also find previous quality program webinars. Uh, I think, April, did you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, Dr. Everson, I just I, I wondered if we could just minimize your team screen just so that the att go. attendees can see the slides. Thank you. There we go. Great. Thank you. All right, uh, with that, let's move on to the February 2023 Quality Program uh, webinar. So the learning objectives today are really, I will provide an overview of the current state of our quality program options at the CPSO and some of the background on our transition from our peer assessment program uh, to the QI options that are currently available. I'll also provide some more specific detail and information on our quality improvement partnership program, which is an option for hospital based physicians. And then we have a guest presentation uh, from the evidence to practice Ontario program. Uh, I'll start with some background on the current state of our quality programs at the CPSO. And starting a few years ago, we did undergo a significant redesign of the options that were available to physicians and really these were built on two of the important principles that guide our work. One is quality care, and one is something called right touch regulation, which you may not be as familiar with, and I'll speak a little bit more about that. In terms of quality of care, we want to offer quality program options that support physicians in Ontario in providing high quality care to their patients. Some background on quality at the CPSO. So for physicians with an active license, there is a requirement to participate in a quality program, and this is from the quality assurance regulation. Historically, this had been our peer assessment program, and that program had been in place for a number of decades, 
and was really designed around a 10 year interval that started once a physician was approximately five years into practice. Uh, going back to 2019, we launched uh, the initial pilot of the redesign of our quality programs. And this is really based on offering quality improvement based options versus having a peer assessment. Uh, peer assessment still exists, still remains an important evaluation tool for uh, the various committees at the college. The other key design principle uh, is something called right touch regulation. And really, this helps to guide almost all the work we do at the CPSO in different areas, but particularly was important in the redesign of our quality programs. And it is an approach and a framework that helps to determine really the appropriate level of our involvement in a particular area or in a particular matter. And it's based on a risk evaluation. And this is particularly relevant uh, to not only the design of all of our quality program options, but more specifically the QI partnership program option, which we're going to focus on today and really acknowledging and recognizing all the quality activity that may exist within an organization and as well the oversight that exists within the st structure uh, of a hospital organization. Some additional background on the redesign and the transition and potential benefits of a quality improvement approach. Uh, and this slide helps to illustrate that with quality assurance, it's really assessing if an individual is meeting a minimal acceptable standard. And ultimately, there is going to be some action or an impact on a small number of individuals. And that had been our experience with the peer assessment program. Whereas with quality improvement, there's potential to have a bigger impact uh, and a greater shift on overall quality, even when uh, a group of individuals that are performing at a very high level are participating. So current state of our quality improvement program options, we have two streams. One is our QI for individuals stream, which has a group subset, and the other is our QI partnership stream, which is an option for hospitals and hospital-based physicians. These these programs are both uh, based on a quality improvement program design and built around right touch regulation as a guiding principle. The other important change was the uh, the interval of participation, and we've moved to a five year cycle as we wanted to have more frequent engagement with physicians in Ontario. So let's talk a little bit more about one of our QI program options, and that's the QI partnership program. So the objective of the QI partnership program is to engage physicians in quality improvement. Uh, we know that quality improvement is a great way to change or improve clinical practice. Uh, and in the context of the partnership program, this program can be utilized and QI can be utilized to support hospital priorities. The other additional benefit of this program as an option is the potential to reduce some of the redundancy that exists uh, for participating physicians. So we wanted to acknowledge and recognize existing quality activity and quality projects that may already be ongoing within an organization, and these are potentially eligible for inclusion uh, within a partnership submission. So the QI partnership program is an option for physicians to participate in a hospital quality improvement project or initiative with their colleagues. And by doing that, they will be able to meet their CPSO quality requirements for a five year period. Um, this is something that is based at the organization and should be something that is aligned and important and relevant to that specific organization. In terms of what hospitals uh, are doing, uh, the design uh, and nature of a quality improvement partnership initiative is quite flexible. We want organizations and the leadership at an organization to do something that is meaningful and relevant to their clinical environment. So the scope of what organizations have been doing and can do is quite flexible. The other key uh, points with deciding on the design of an initiative is to make sure that it's feasible. You know, align what you are planning to do with the resources that you have available. And when we look across the province of Ontario, there are going to be organizations that are smaller 
and have more limited quality improvement resources or expertise. Uh, and we recognize that, and that is fine. We want initiatives to come in that um, align with the resources and expertise that you have, and ultimately that is a feasible, feasible way to be successful with the project. As I mentioned briefly, certainly existing quality activity and quality initiatives are eligible. For the QI Partnership Program, organizations submit a proposal to us that is reviewed, and the proposal should follow a fairly standard QI project charter, and we provide a proposal form that helps to guide the design and submission of an initiative. So identifying uh, what the issue is, having an aim statement, um, defining the scope, and really identifying how individual, individual physicians are intersecting and participating in the initiative in terms of reflection and feedback. The other requirement, and this is common to um, our other QI program streams for physicians to meet their requirements, is the completion of two online reflective activities. So for a physician within the partnership stream to meet their quality requirements, they will be listed as a participant on their organization's proposal and once they are enrolled, they will then be given access to these two reflective activities to complete. A little bit on the experience to date with the QI Partnership Program. Currently, we now have 56 hospitals that have approved quality improvement projects. And when we look at those, there is really a focus on what is relevant and meaningful to their own clinical environment. What are the organizational priorities and how they are using the partnership program to support that? As mentioned there, we have, we have received quite a variety of different initiatives and proposals, all the, from large multi-site organizations, all the way to smaller community-based hospitals. I've mentioned the reflective activities, again, a program requirement for physicians to meet their, their uh, requirements for a five-year interval. This slide is just an example of what some organizations are doing and looking at things like reduction in unsigned physician orders, safety around opioid prescribing. So again, relevant patient safety and quality initiatives for that particular organization. We've had organizations as well focus on physician wellness and creating a physician wellness program for their physicians. Um, and in addition, another example would be looking at resource utilization and um, using the Choosing YZ Canada hospital designation program or recommendations and incorporating that into an initiative. Just some examples of what people are doing. A little bit on the process. So for an organization, there's a decision made to pursue a partnership submission uh, and the proposal is submitted to us for review. Post, post review, we provide the approval message and that is when we enroll you, uh, your physicians and that is when we update their individual status in terms of the activity of their quality program participation. And that is when they receive access to the online activities. Uh, mentioned uh, an option that we are continuing to pilot and this is an option for physicians age 70 and older, and this is called QI Enhanced. So late 2022, we launched the pilot of what we call QI Enhanced for Partnership. And this is an option for physicians over the age of 70. Over the age of 70, current state is there is a requirement to have an age-related peer assessment every five years. But we are currently pilot piloting alternate paths to that for physicians that are interested in participating in one of our QI-based program streams. So for 2023, this is the current state of our QI-enhanced pilot options. Uh, it's for physicians age 70 to 72, and there's two streams. One is within the partnership stream, and the other is uh, through the individual stream. So just, uh, just to raise some awareness on this pilot. And this slide summarize, summarizes uh, the activities that are required uh, within each of these streams. For QI Enhanced Partnership, 
a physician is listed as a participant on a hospital QI initiative, whereas with QI enhanced individuals, they are submitting a practice improvement plan that is developed based within our online uh, learning platform. So summary of options for physicians to meet their CPSO quality requirements for a five year period. We have our QI based activities, QI for individuals. Uh, within individuals, there is a groups subset. There's additional information on our website about that. And then we have our QI partnership program for hospitals. Again, there are some common uh, requirements within each of the streams and the activities are intended to help physicians generate ideas uh, to reflect on their practice and identify areas for improvement. Peer, as I mentioned, peer assessment still exists, uh, and this, this can be an option. So to summarize some of the, the messaging around this, for an individual physician, uh, quality improvement is now an alternate path uh, versus peer assessment as a way to meet your quality requirements with us at the CPSO. And we, we believe and feel that things have been designed to help reduce some of the redundancy in meeting and fulfilling the various professional requirements that we all have as practicing physicians. So by participating in one of our QI streams, um, physicians can concurrently claim CPD credits with the Royal College or with the CFBC. And in addition, they may be able to meet some organizational specific um, reappointment or academic reappointment requirements. For hospitals and for the medical leadership at an organization, we believe this is an opportunity to engage physicians uh, with their participation on any important patient safety or quality initiatives because of the additional benefits they will obtain and realize by their participation, meeting their requirements with us at the CPSO, also being able to, to claim CPD credits. I'm not gonna take questions right now. We're gonna try and hold those till the end of the presentation, but just the contact information that is listed uh, if you wanted to reach out and follow up or for additional resources that are located on our website. So with that, I will transition and hand over to our colleagues from the Center for Effective Practice to speak about the Evidence to Practice Ontario program. Thank you, Dr. Everson. Can everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up. Yes, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. We're pleased to be joining you today to talk about a provincial initiative called the Evidence to Practice Program Ontario. And this program is funded in partnership by the Ministry of Health's Digital Health Division and also Ontario Health and is delivered by a consortium. Uh, my colleague V2 and I are here representing the consortium and that includes the eHealth Center of Excellence, the Center for Effective Practice and North York General Hospital. Uh, Dr. Everson introduced my colleague Pippi, however, she's not joining us today. Um, you just got V2 and I, um, uh, so hopefully that's that's good. Um, next slide, V2, thank you, or Dr. Everson, thank you. So uh, this is our agenda for the um, presentation, and our intention is to give you an overview of the program, talk to you about the partnership opportunity that we hope to grow through building some awareness of the program and specifically what this means for you, clinicians, and the opportunity for you. Um, we hope to have a couple of minutes at the end, as Dr. Everson mentioned, a Q&A to uh, address any questions that you have. Thank you. Next slide. So our objectives today, as I've mentioned, are to speak about how this program can support your CPSO QI partnership proposal and how you can take advantage of this provincially funded program and any questions that you have about the available supports that we provide, we hope to address today. Thank you. Next slide. So the vision for the Evidence to Practice Ontario program um, and our work is, as I've mentioned, it's a partnership of the Ministry of Health, their Digital Health Division and Ontario Health. And you may be familiar with the Ontario Quality Standards. These are quality standards that were developed by Health Quality Ontario, now Ontario Health. And quality standards outline for clinicians and patients what quality care looks like 
and are focused on conditions where there are gaps between the care provided in the province and the care that patients should receive. Our work, the Evidence to Practice Ontario program, leverages technology to activate those quality standards. As you will hear from V2, we are working with acute and primary care clinicians to co-design and implement digital functionalities that seamlessly integrate up-to-date evidence, the quality standards, into point-of-care tools, specifically acute care HISs and primary care EMRs. Next slide, please. Just a sort of brief summary of what quality standards are. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Not sure, maybe the slide presentation's not moving. It's not moving for me. Maybe it is for other people. It's moving for me, Angelica. It's currently oh. on the role of E2P Ontario Partners. Oh, okay. If you could go back one slide. Sorry about that. Thank you. I don't know why I wasn't seeing that. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with quality standards, the development of quality standards, which is the foundation of the Evidence to Practice Ontario program, these are rooted in the 2019 Connecting Care Act. And what drives this work, as I've mentioned, is the goal of addressing variation and gaps between what we know is evidence-based or optimal care and the care being delivered in the province by developing tools and resources to guide system and care improvements to address these gaps and inconsistencies. Next slide. So the roles of the partners, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a program that's being implemented by three partners, a consortium, and I'm pleased now to pass the microphone to V2, who is our North York General Hospital partner lead, who's now going to speak about the tools and the opportunity for you as you seek a quality improvement program to implement in your practice area or hospital. Thank you, V2, over to you. Hey, great, thanks, Angelica. And if you can move to the next slide. Um, great, so although the focus of this overall presentation is mainly for acute care and discussing some of the exciting work done within the hospital uh, sector, we did want to take a moment to outline some of the exciting work actually done in the primary care sector. Um, through the collaboration of CEP as well as the EHL Center of Excellence, along with uh, multiple consultations with stakeholders, clinicians, um, other organizations, uh, the primary care uh, portion of this program seeks to develop tools that are available directly to download into existing EMRs, so TELS, PSS, Oscar, and Acura. Um, across all of the four initial use cases that we're looking to do as a program, which includes heart failure, major depression, anxiety, and diabetes, um, these tools will be will essentially look to uh, incorporate all of the quality statements that are part of a quality standard into it so that physicians can have uh, different aspects of the tool all incorporated into one within their EMR. Uh, this kind of translates into having time savers. So again, uh, ensuring that everything is in one toolbar, understanding the existing workflow of the clinician and looking to see how we can save them time as they look to document as well as when they uh, interact with their patients to deliver quality care. Um, on top of that, we uh, the different enhancements uh, look to Im uh, embed a modular approach so that it fits within a clinician's workflow and also supports different aspects of how a patient visit can go um, in, in, in ways that a clinician can focus on certain aspects if it and tailor their, their sort of care towards their patient. And then finally, they also we also look to provide tailored guidance, recommendations, and supports. So providing uh, change management supports and academic detailing to ensure that the tool can be leveraged as appropriate given the variety of different clinical settings, especially within the primary care sector. Um, on to the next slide. Now, within acute care, it is it is similar. We are focusing on four use cases again: heart failure, major depression, anxiety, and diabetes. However, the nature of the work with acute care is slightly different than primary care. Uh, we work directly with hospitals to better understand their existing workflows and also identify and address any sort of gaps within those specific use cases in relation to the quality standard and figure out how we can uh, create meaningful change within their HIS system. So whether it be Epic, Cerner, or Meditech, and how that can better support delivering quality. Care Care, again, as outlined uh, with the quality standard as sort of the basis of evidence. Uh, on top of that, one of the more exciting aspects of this program is the ability to collaborate. Uh, having multiple hospital partners looking to implement similar use cases allows us and gives us the opportunity to connect with uh, connect hospitals with each other, to learn from their QI teams, from their clinical informatics teams, from their other physicians, and being able to share best practices across each hospital 
both in terms of how they deliver quality care uh, for a specific use case, but also how they leverage their systems to deliver the most efficient and optimal care uh, possible. Another major benefit from this is the ability to data generate. So based off the enhancements that we look to create per use case, which we'll go into a bit more detail later on, we're able to generate data on standard adherence, understanding if clinicians are adhering to standards, where there are gaps in, in our sort of delivering quality care and using that as a basis to drive quality improvement initiatives in the future. And then finally, we look to develop sort of tailored change management strategies and toolkits for organizations. Again, the overall purpose is to reduce work effort in the future for an organization to implement this, uh, implement these use cases, but also to provide supports for uh, different physicians uh, to be able to adopt the different enhancements outlined as part of the ETP program, but also that are generated in collaboration with these different partnerships across hospitals. Um, on to the next slide. So here's a bit of an overview of how we try to essentially map some of the, the work that we're doing within the Evidence of Practice on Chair program and how it can relate to a hospital's uh, QI initiative. Uh, first and foremost, the different use cases we're looking to prioritize can align with existing priority populations for your OHTs or for your hospitals, um, and thus being able to create enhancements uh, that support quality care in those domains can enable the organizations to improve quality care for, the, for those priority populations. Uh, on top of that, as I mentioned, being able to collect data on standard adherence can allow us to drive quality care in the future, recognizing where our successes are, but also recognizing where our gaps are. And then being able to compare that standard adherence across hospitals can give us a mechanism to be able to understand and, and learn from other hospitals in terms of what best practices they're employing uh, to better uh, achieve better standard adherence and again, better quality care. Um, on top of that, as part of our overall creation process, we look to review existing workflows, understand the local nuances with each um, with each hospital, and then understand opportunities for physicians to improve their care, but also for the hospitals to improve their overall workflow processes. Um, again, with this overall support of overall drive to improve quality care in the future. Um, and then finally, based off our collaboration, we look to uh, facilitate coaching and feedback at the organizational level, again, providing the means for an organization and, and creating the space for an organization to prioritize these quality initiatives, as well as learning from each other to action and you sort of lessons learned based off the data that we end up generating. Um, on to the next slide. So now I'll walk through a, a, a use case example of what we've done so far within our heart failure use case, which is currently live at two hospitals, at Northrop General Hospital and at St. Mary's General Hospital. And we tried to basically replicate a similar process across multiple different use cases throughout the Evidence of Practice Ontario program. Um, so again, we start with the heart failure quality statements as a sort of basis to understand what exactly are the priorities to improve uh, quality care within for patients with heart failure. And then we look to figure out how we can take these quality statements and digitize them. What are sort of the gaps that are currently existing within a specific hospital's workflow that relate to the quality statements? And then how does that, uh, how can we enable an enhancement digitally that will better support the clinician in delivering quality care for those specific um, statements? So with this, we tend to do a lot of clinical consultation. So we have a clinical task group, which consists of clinicians from our partnering hospitals, um, as well as other topic experts across the province, both in primary care and acute care, to really look at the quality statements and also idea generate and understand where exactly we can improve uh, can improve quality care within a hospital setting, and also what is, uh, what is more feasible to do given our, our existing uh, implementation timelines. From this overall iterative process of, con of consulting clinicians, stakeholders, patients, et cetera, uh, we were able to land on three quality statements of the heart failure quality standard to prioritize. And that includes uh, the quality statements related to diagnosing, quadruple therapy, and transitions in care. And then based off the existing HIS system, we have further tailored that down into enhancements directly to the HF admission, uh, heart failure admission order set, the clinician facing discharge summary, and the patient facing discharge summary. Um, from there, we kind of take our scope and then work directly with hospitals to again understand their existing workflow. So, how what sort of what's their current state of their order set? What is their current state of their discharge summaries? And then what sort of ways can we enhance these to again provide better quality care um, for our patients across each hospital? Um, this is overall an iterative process, again, consulting with the hospitals themselves, but then also consulting with our existing governance processes, uh, with our topic expert groups, and with the overall consortium, as well as Ontario Health and the Ministry of Health. And then we look to identify exactly what can be changed within an HIS system to support this, and uh, then look to implement. 
Um, and, a and a concurrent process is also to data generate. So how can we map terminology in the back end to again better support data collection that can generate um, collection of standard adherence data that can drive quality improvement in the future. Um, on to the next slide. So here's one of the examples of, of the many enhancements that are made to the patient discharge summary, and we also have other examples that uh, showcase some of the enhancements made to the heart failure order set as well as the clinician facing discharge summary. Uh, but one of the, uh, the the more interesting enhancements that we made to the patient discharge summary was to leverage what we call a dot phrase, which is uh, pretty common within the Cerner system, um, which is a way for a physician when creating a patient discharge summary to type, let's say, dot CHF, and then populate templated best practice instructions that can that can be leveraged uh, for their patients as as the patients are being discharged from hospital to home. Uh, this gives a sort of basis for patients to be able to understand what exactly they need to do uh, to so to continue their care once they leave the hospital. But we also look to do this within a patient friendly way and also get patient feedback throughout this overall process. As part of creating some of the enhancements to our discharge summaries, we're able to consult over 60 uh, patient family advisors from Ontario Health to again ensure that what we're doing resonates with the, the end users of the overall tool. And on top of that, this is also customizable. So physicians can be able to edit this again if there are different nuances with their patient population or with their specific patients uh, to make sure that these uh, that this really does support their transition uh, in care from hospital to home. Uh, on to the next slide. So this slide briefly walks through our overall data collection process. So whether your site is a Cerner site, an Epic site, or a Meditech site, what we look to do in the back end is map to a common uh, terminology called SNOMED CT. Um, we've leveraged SNOMED CT in our Cerner environment, and we're looking to do that within the Epic and Meditech environments currently with our other hospital partners. Um, but what this enables us to do is pull data on overall standard adherence metrics. Then we're then able to kind of roll up that data that's being sent to us and then be able to compare across hospitals in terms of understanding what our overall standard adherence metrics are. And then again, this helps us understand our current state as well as what we can do to potentially improve um, our quality care in the future. Uh, on to the next slide. Here's an example of some of the process indicators we're able to collect from our heart failure implementation across North Ridge Island St. Mary's. So based off of this overall process, we identified our indicators and we were able to map them to SNOMED CT and then had each hospital pull on a report that uh, that references SNOMED CT to ensure that we're comparing apples to apples. That the heart failure admission order set ordered metric, for example, that we're comparing within North Ridge General is equivalent to the one that we're comparing in St. Mary's. Um, one example I want to showcase was the initial labs ordered. So we wanted to, uh, as part of the heart failure quality standard, one of the process indicators was to ensure that initial labs are completed within 24 hours for patients who are diagnosed with CHF. And you can notice a big discrepancy between uh, hospital A and hospital B. When we provide this report back to the cardiology teams at the hospital, they were then able to uh, understand that there is a larger gap in care and consult with the other partner hospital to better understand why exactly this percentage was so low. And then from there, they were able to try and take meaningful action. So, for example, within this, this specific example, they realized PT and INR weren't consistently ordered within that hospital. Um, so they looked to, to consult their overall QI teams as well as their clinical informatics teams to see where they can make changes as part of their overall process, whether that be as an enhancement back into the order set to support the ordering of PT and INR or through uh, different consultations and change management strategies with their physicians in the future. But again, just one example of, of some of the many metrics we're looking to collect uh, to again support quality care in the future. Um, on to the next slide. And here's an example of some of the implementation toolkits. As I mentioned before, as part of this overall program, we want to make sure we can share lessons learned from the hospitals that we look to implement with and reduce the work effort in the future. Uh, so with this, we look to create toolkits that support not only clinicians, but also our clinical informatics teams and hospital admin staff to be able to implement uh, these sort of use cases in the future. Um, we've looked to create examples of our patient discharge summary enhancements, our provider discharge summary enhancements, as well as, uh, as, well as detailing the steps of how we can actually pull reports from our systems uh, to be able to support quality uh, adherence metric uh, collection and, and ongoing reporting. And with this, we look to share this with other hospitals as we get more examples through Epic, Meditech, and Cerner across all of our use cases to uh, to better support the spread and scale of this program because because our overall goal really is to ensure that we have all these quality statements implemented 
across all hospitals in Ontario um, in, in the long term. Um, on to the next slide. So here's the slide that showcases some of the partners engaged to date. As I mentioned, for heart failure, we actually are currently live with North Georgia and St. Mary's, and we're actually currently working with seven different sites, uh, including Windsor Regional, Hotel Dia, uh, St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton, Waypoint, Ontario Shores, North Bay, and Cornwall to implement our anxiety and major depression quality standards. I'm not sure on this map is also another partner of ours working on the, di the diabetes implementation, which is Arm Prior Regional Health. Again, this showcases that we're currently partnering with sites across Ontario, but also across multiple HIS systems. So Cerner, Epic, and Meditech, and we're hoping to leverage uh, the lessons learned from these partnerships to be able to support future hospitals and being involved with the E2P program uh, as the program continues. Um, on to the next slide. And then what's next for Evidence to Practice Ontario program? So currently we're proceeding with our implementation for major depression, anxiety, and diabetes. We'll be looking to evaluate some of the early successes of this program uh, as we complete all of our, our initial round of use cases. Um, but on top of that, we're also looking to recruit and expand. We want more hospitals to be able to join our overall initiative uh, and provide them the space to be able to participate in this initiative um, and implement these quality statements, uh, leveraging some of the successes from our early adopters, but also looking to advance the implementation with these new adopters. Uh, and then finally, we're also looking on to collaborate with OH and MOH on how we can sustain this program going forward and how this program might be able to evolve over time. Um, on to the next slide. Now here's our, here's some quick examples of uh, the depression, anxiety, quality enhancements, and, and what exactly we're doing within these different use cases. Um, so if you can just click through, you'll you'll see some screenshots appear um, as we go through this aspect of the slide. Um, but essentially, what we're looking to do within our major depression, anxiety, quality statement, uh, quality standard implementations, is to uh, digitize the PHP nine and GAD seven at these hospitals. Again, ensuring that we can have this uh, be collected to help support identification and comprehensive assessment, but not only just collect them, we want to be able to trend these scores over time. So a clinician can actually understand and have like a sort of dashboard view of how a patient's PHP-9 and GAD7 scores uh, change over time. Again, as like a, a, a small step towards implementing measurement-based care to better support uh, the, the treatment and the interventions that they can provide to their patients. Um, if you can click on, and there's also a overall, there's also alerts that we're looking to generate based off of the scores of the PHP-9 and GAD7. They are increasing over time. It might generate an alert to help support uh, clinical decision-making for our physicians uh, as, as the uh, implementation continues. Um, on to the next slide. In diabetes, we are looking to do something similar uh, uh, in terms of the transitions and care element to heart failure. Um, however, one of the other aspects of this implementation that we're focusing on is creating a backend algorithm to better understand and support patients who have poorly controlled sugars or who have newly diagnosed diabetes being admitted to the hospital. And with this, we're leveraging the he elevated hemoglobin A1C and then looking to provide recommendations uh, to clinicians to follow up with their patients based off of the elevated hemoglobin A1C. So this could be depending on the hospital's resources, either referral to a diabetes outpatient clinic, endocrinologist, clinical nurse educator, or even prompts, again, to better uh, enable uh, diabetes management discharge instructions and handouts that can support a patient as they transition from hospital to home. Recognizing that diabetes is uh, is sometimes under uh, is might not be the primary diagnosis for some patients as they uh, as they uh, enter into the hospital. Um, on to the next slide. Now we want to talk briefly about the opportunity for hospital partnerships. Uh, so being part of the E2P program, it does enable uh, your hospital to play a sort of leadership role in accelerating the adoption of the quality standards. Uh, this program is essentially a year and a half old, and we're looking to have our first round of implementations um, completed by uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the upcoming months. And then we'll also be looking to expand to other hospitals. So being part of this overall initiative allows you to have your voice heard and being able to drive how these quality statements can be implemented within your specific settings and for your specific patient populations. 
On top of that, the aspect of collaborating uh, is, is one of the major benefits that we've been seeing from our hospital partners that we've been connecting with so far. For example, our Cornwall hospital partners are able to learn from our Ontario Shores hospital partners. Even though they don't have the same HIS system, they're able to share the different practices that they're leveraging to be able to uh, complete a PHV-9 and GAD-7 or to be able to support their patients uh, through their discharge process and what other education materials that they can share. Um, so again, being part of this gives you access to this network to be able to connect with more hospitals, more clinicians, and then more quality improvement specialists. And then finally, the ultimate goal of this program is to really support clinicians and being able to deliver quality care by making enhancements that aren't intrusive, but also uh, adhere to their existing workflows uh, over time. And then on to the next slide. And then we recognize that implementations aren't easy. They do take they do take effort and work. But with the Evidence to Practice Ontario program, what we hope to do is create the space for organizations to uh, to prioritize these quality improvement initiatives, but also be able to conduct them and implement them um, at a at a pace that is uh, that is suitable for their resources. Uh, so with this, we look to provide funding to the sites uh, to the hospital sites to be able to support different costs of implementation, whether that be the time for the clinical informatics resources to look at their HIS system and develop these enhancements, or for clinician time to be able to consult them as we look to see what is the best method for us to enable these quality standards within their settings. On top of that, the Evidence to Practice Ontario program team is pretty robust. We look to provide project management support to ensure that a hospital uh, knows what resources they need and who they need to bring to each table to be able to progress in implementation forward. Um, as well as facilitate clinical informatics thought leadership. So leveraging the CI resources at Northridge General Hospital, as well as some of the thought leaders uh, that are part of our overall provincial governance structures to understand different nuances with technical design and how we can better enable these enhancements within their system, but also support uh, ongoing reporting. And then finally, change management. Again, understanding what what the changes are at each hospital and how we can better support their physicians in being able to adopt these changes over time. On to the next slide. And then finally, uh, to be part of this program, what we would like to do is for hospitals or physicians to be able to express interest. Um, and you can do that by visiting www.e2p.ca. There's a small forum that that uh, will go to us that we can uh, then follow up with you to have a further conversation about being an E2P partner, or you can always just email me directly if your hospital is interested. Um, we are looking for more sites to join our overall initiative, specifically within the heart failure and diabetes use case, um, but happy to talk more offline as we can provide more details on the different use cases you might be interested in and how uh, you can become a partner in the future. Um, but yes, thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Angelica. Thank you, V2. Uh, so at this stage, um, let's open it up for any questions. Uh, I will back to this screen. Uh, and I don't know, April, if there's any questions that you had picked up or if anyone wants to just, we, we're gonna open it up and see if there's any questions. You can unmute yourself and we can, we can uh, field some questions. So all questions have been addressed in the chat so far, Dr. Everson, but certainly if anyone would like to ask a question of the QI program staff or our colleagues at Center for Effective Practice, please raise your hand and we'll enable your mic. Looks like there's a question from uh, Karen. Yeah, Karen, please go ahead. So Karen, I don't know if you can, if you're muted or not, uh, we do have a couple others with a question. So maybe we'll move on to the second one, and that was from. Uh, can you now? Yeah, Karen. Yeah, we can oh, hear you now. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm Karen Edstrom. I'm a community-based dermatologist, and uh, you know, I've been invited to to uh, participate in the QI program. 
and I, I'm just not sure what what is expected, what I'm supposed to do. And I know this talk has been about like hospital-based physicians, so um, you know I'm not really sure how it pertains to me, or do I have to find a, a kind of a project myself to focus on to do a similar type of thing? Um, I was just wondering if you're able to to help sort out what I what I, I have to do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so for this, this webinar was definitely more focused on the QI partnership stream, which is hospital based. And what you've been, sounds like you've been selected for is the quality improvement individuals stream. And so within that, um, when you go into the platform, there are a number of activities that you will uh, work through. And those activities are intended to, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, review your own practice, reflect on different elements of your practice, uh, review some practice related data if that's available. Ultimately, all of those activities feed into developing what we're calling a practice improvement plan. And the practice improvement plan uh, needs to contain a minimum of two quality improvement goals that you design and submit to us. Now within that and within the online activities, there is guidance and information on how to do that. The actual practice improvement plan is a structured, fillable template uh, that prompts you in terms of how what you should be considering when you're designing something. So as you work through the activities, it's helped to generate some, some areas that you might want to look at with your practice. You then develop two quality improvement goals around that. So that's that stream. There's additional information on our website about that program, so QI for individuals. We've done previous webinars that will give an overview and more detail on that stream, on the activities. So that's definitely a reference that you can go to. Again, going through our, our, our website, cpso.on.ca, and or link, linking to our, our YouTube channel. So there'll be information uh, on that. And um, yeah, that, that's what that's what the consideration is for you. Does that help, Karen? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, OK. So another hand up is from Mariana. Mariana, do you want to go ahead? Hi, Mariana, if you're still there, you could uh, you can ask your question. I think you're muted right now. Hello. Yeah, hello. Uh, just one question is uh, relative to the button to the QI for individuals that um, <clears throat> um, are we going to uh, submit a proposal? and uh, so substantially by that deadline and uh, then uh, will be reviewed with the chief of staff or the proposal that's practically the CPA so keep the approval uh, and then uh, substantially we will uh, um, um, submit the results um, or the findings um, with the chief of staff. Um, how How is uh, does it work for a, a hospitalist? So I think what your initial decision is or how to approach this is, are you submitting something on your own through our yes. individuals program? Is that what you're referring to? Yes, indeed. Okay, yes. so that is something that does not involve necessarily any review with someone at your organization or your chief of staff. Okay. This is something that you develop on your own. Um, there, as I said, there's guidance and all of the work is done within the platform that you are provided access to. Uh, you're ultimately you develop your your it's not a proposal, but we're calling it a practice improvement plan that has two quality improvement goals relevant to your practice that you've developed. That does get submitted to us and that's reviewed by one of our physician quality improvement coaches. So that's kind of the process of how it's developed, it gets submitted directly to us, not not anything to do with your own hospital. Mm -hmm. And then one of our, uh, someone at our program, one of our physician QA coaches reviews it. 
Okay, and how long does it take once you get uh, my proposal to get approval? In terms of you, so if you've submitted something and then it being reviewed and then there being communication back to you, is that the is that the question? Yes, exactly. That the, the, the time frame. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe let April jump in just for accurate and updated follow up times. April, are you able to comment comment on that? Yeah, of course. So within your uh, your scheduled deadline, so uh, I would use the example if your deadline is March 1st and you're in a QI individuals or QI group subset and you've submitted your practice improvement plan, what we relate to participants is that within 20 business days of your deadline, so even if you've submitted early, we do try to address you earlier and that's been happening this year, but at the very latest 20 business days from your deadline, you'll hear from our QI program staff in terms of next steps. Okay, fair enough. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Severson, there's a few questions in the chat specific to, uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to speak to uh, Dr. Chen, the QI individual has a final deadline. Is there an intermediate deadline for completion of each module? Um, I can jump in and answer that question. So, for all streams, uh, for QI partnership, for example, you are supplied with a deadline on enrollment um, by which you would have your practice profile activity and your self-guided chart review activity completed. So that's effective the deadline for both those activities or the requirements for that program. For QI individuals and QI individuals group subset, the deadline represents the, the date by which all of the online activities and the practice improvement plan must be submitted. So there is in effect not an intermediate deadline, um, the, the the decision is up to you in terms of on what time frame you'd like to complete the activities all ahead of that specific deadline that you've chosen. And I would just reiterate for any participant in our QI programs, if for whatever reason uh, you would require some additional time, be it to complete the two activities in partnership or complete the activities and submit your practice improvement plan in QI individuals, we're more than happy to offer extensions. So please simply just give our team a call or reply via portal message and QI staff would be happy to accommodate you. Thanks, April. There is an additional uh, comment in the chat or question in the chat from Dr. Marksa. Can an individual's deadline be switched to earlier? Uh, certainly. Uh, and if you would like just simply to submit your practice improvement plan without requesting a deadline switch, that's available to you too. Our complement of QI coaches who are reviewing those practice improvement plans are doing an excellent job getting back to our participants at a very quick rate this year. So by all means, reach out if you'd like to formalize a deadline switch or simply feel free to submit earlier than you had previously planned. Both we would welcome. All right. Um, so let's see the next in the chat here. I see one from from Emily. Does lack of staffing, both MD, RN, and other health worker, not impede this QI program? Uh, maybe we. I'll, I'll try to. I'll take a stab at that. So, uh, you know, if if you're looking at maybe workload considerations, time considerations. Um, not sure if you're referring to a practice that's uh, in the hospital or out of the hospital, if it's group or solo. Uh, there's a couple considerations, things that I can mention. So one, you know, as practicing physicians, we do have requirements. We have requirements with us, the CPSO. We have requirements for CPD. Um, I think one feature of our program and the adoption of QI as an approach is the ability to concurrently meet other requirements that we all have. So by participating in the individual stream, uh, by doing QI, uh, or by doing it through the partnership stream or group stream, um, there is alignment with other organizations and you can, you can claim CPD credits as well. And as some of you may know, there is a lot of interest and uh, to, to have physicians participate and do quality improvement. And so credits for that are, are more incentivized. I think that if there is a challenge with your model of care, 
Um, we recognize that there has been a lot of stress on the system, on individual physicians through the various stages of the pandemic. You know, if there's challenges within your own model of care, you could actually develop that as a quality improvement goal. Um, but certainly different ways to approach that. And um, those would just be my initial comments on that. And I think as April responded to, certainly any specific questions related to our quality programs or related to your individual selection, you can contact us directly. We're happy to uh, speak with you and uh, answer any questions. And the telephone number is there. Also, as mentioned, our website has information and resources with respect to our quality program streams. And there's a question appending from uh, Dr. Hainan. John, please go ahead. There's a time today to answer all these questions. I have just uh, one quick question. Uh, if after you submitted a module and, uh, you know, when you when you review this after after you submitted this, like one of the questions was answered, uh, um, you know, by mistake, like no uh, wrong. Uh, can you go back and edit this question or it's uh, like once it's submitted, it's it's too late. So I can I can answer that one for you. So specific to the reflection or online activities in the learning management system. So those that you're leveraging to build your practice improvement plan, there are some elements of those activities where it does not allow you to go back. It depends on how far along you are specific to the piece that's reviewed by the college. So the practice improvement, improvement plan, and I can't emphasize that enough, that is the only piece that is reviewed by the college in terms of your requirement for QI individuals is your practice improvement plan, that you certainly can edit. And we've had a number of participating positions that have submitted and then reflected a bit and said, oh, on second thought, I'd like to change this to this. Um, by all means, we can assist you with that. It does require some staff intervention. So I would just say, please get a hold of us by a portal message or call, and we'd be happy to set that up in the system for you. Thank you so much. Maybe we'll, we're are running out of time here. There is one other question that I see. The question is around, I have independently completed several QI projects over the years. Uh, colleagues have benefited from these. Uh, would I be able to use these as, um, as I guess, as a submission? Um, so certainly, um, quality work that you are engaged in, have been engaged in, is potentially eligible for submission through either stream. Uh, if it's something you've maybe done on your own, I think there are some time and recency considerations with respect to submitting it, um, but we could definitely explore that further with you. Possibly some work that you've done could be drafted into a new practice improvement plan, and maybe there's a next step to the work that you've done, so you can use some of that content. Uh, so different, different options available if you've been engaged in doing quality work. And uh, if it's for you as an individual, might be helpful to reach out to us directly for some further clarification. Um, let's see here, hospital-based programs. Okay, Emily's following up, I think, on her question. Again, for hospital-based options, this is something where you would want to work, if you are a medical leader at your organization, or if not, you would want to work with your med medical leadership colleagues and, and develop something uh, from an organizational perspective. So identifying something that could be relevant to uh, that's fairly broadly scoped and relevant to many of your medical staff. And that way you can evaluate what you want to focus on, what resources are available, uh, and, and define that further. So I would, if you are looking at something partnership and you're worried about resources that are available, um, again, I would connect with your other medical leaders and uh, determine if that's the route that you want to go in terms of a project. OK, so listen, everyone, we'll we'll maybe wrap up at this time. I wanted to thank everyone uh, for coming to the webinar today. Hopefully you found it informative. I wanted to thank our colleagues again uh, with respect to the uh, evidence to practice uh, program. 
I think there was some helpful information there, uh, some takeaways that you can utilize for quality improvement. Again, this webinar is recorded. It will be uh, linked on our website where there is some additional resources um, that you can, can reference and explore. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to our programs. Contact information is on our website. You can email or call us and we can get back to you. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending and uh, take care.